We have been, last week we, we tackled something with uh, Did Jesus ever meet, uh, well, did Jesus ever say anything about homosexuality? My liberal brothers and sisters have said over and over, no, he never addressed it, so therefore, why should, why should we make a big deal about it? I, I uh, tend to disagree. I believe Jesus did directly uh, speak of the gay community, and we talked about that last week. If you were not here last week, I do not have time to recap on that. So you have to go back and listen to on uh, our, our Facebook or our podcast. But I can I did not have time to talk about that. We talked about the word eunuch and 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 what have you. We really broke that down. And it is it is. A, a belief, and it is the belief that your pastor shares that Jesus did directly address that, and he, he did not condemn it. In fact, he did the opposite. He uplifted, and it was a very much of a norm in his conversation with his disciples concerning the homosexual community. Now, I'm going to go further today, and the reason why we're doing this, we're kind of like, we're in a Christian series, but since this is Jesus, and it kind of, like, um, you know, goes in with Christianity. We're still in the series, but because of Pride, it happened a couple weeks ago. How many of you guys were a part of Pride? That was awesome, an amazing weekend. Um, a lot of people within the church here were coming up to me and saying, Rich, we need to wrestle with this theologically. I need my heart to connect with my mind. You understand? I need my heart, what's happening inside of me, what I know God is leading me, where I believe the Spirit is leading me on this theologically, I need it to impact my mind because my mind has been trained a certain way for many years now. And I need to be empowered, I need to be empowered to help people uh, understand where we are as a faith community concerning human sexuality. So that's why we're, we're kind of, like, we've changed a little bit our schedule, our plan, because we believe the Holy Spirit is wanting, us, is, is, is wanting us to address this. Is everyone okay with that? Sure? Hello? All right. I know it's Labor Day weekend. I know. So real quick, I will recap on this. The scriptures, the Holy Bible, all right, Anybody brought their Bible this week? I said to bring your Bibles. Did you bring your Bible? A few of you? Okay. Pentecostal people here always bring their Bibles. <laughs> um, when we look at this, we have to wrestle with several different things. When we look at the issue of homosexuality in the scriptures, we have to wrestle with several different things. Uh, one, we have to look at the authors of the Gospels and the New Testament. We have to wrestle with that. Secondly, we have to look at the original writings, who wrote it, and that it was written in the language of the ancient Hebrew and Greek, which are languages that have not evolved. It, it is ended. I'm talking about, you know, Greek now, but I'm talking about ancient Hebrew and Greek. It is a language that has not evolved since the writing of the New Testament. And that also that the New Testament was written within or around the Roman Empire. The Romans occupied Israel at the time of the story that we're going to talk about today. And that the Greek language in the Roman Empire and the Roman culture definitely impacted the writer's of this book. It's very important that we remember that, okay? That it was written in a time, obviously, by, in the Hebrew and Greek language, and so therefore, the phrase or the terminologies and the wording that was very common in the Roman Empire would have influenced the writings within the New Testament. And we also have to look at the context in which it was written. That this book was written by Jewish people. Okay? We always have to be willing, and not just willing, but we must as followers of Jesus, to look at the New Testament solely written by Jewish people in the land that they were in at the time. And then last, but surely not least, we have to 
come to a place that this is the word of God. This is the word of God. It is inspired by God. This is the word of God and it is inspired by God. I absolutely love this book. It is a book that has guided me. It is a book in its letters and stories and journeys of my ancient brothers and sisters, our ancient brothers and sisters in the faith that has lifted us up in times of difficulty, that has empowered us to look and to sense where God has led his people in the past and where God desires to lead his people now. It is the inspired word of God. Now, with that said, this is not God. Okay? This book is not God. It is a book about God. It is a book about God interacting with humans. It is a book about humans responding to a loving God. All right? I wish I could take a photo of your, your faces right now. It's awesome. <laughs> this book is people's journeys interacting with the God in the desert, with the God starting a nation, a people, a people in rebellion, hello? A people trying to find God, a people leaving God, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then God becoming one of us in a process, and I use this word uh, purposely, in a process of rescuing us, God becomes one of us in the form of Jesus to rescue us in reconciliation and bringing the world back into himself. And then the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is, Jesus is, uh, Jesus, uh, is crucified, rose again, and we know through the letters of the early church, the Holy Spirit inhabits the believers now, which makes us people who are not just seeing and listening to a carpenter, but now this Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, lives within the followers of God. The Holy Spirit lives within us. The image of God, the spark of God is tapped within us and the Holy Spirit brings that to life, gives us the ability to follow Jesus. This is all in the scriptures and what God desires of his, of his people, his church, and how he desires for it to make a difference in the world. That's all there. It's all there. But it is not God. Okay? The scriptures is not God. Which leads me to a story that has been discussed for hundreds of years and in the last hundred years, very much so within the progressive Christian community and definitely in the last 50 years the story of the Roman centurion. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the people that have followed you years and years and years ago. And we thank you that your spirit is just as alive now that it was then. And we thank you that we are in a place, a community of faith that we can dare ask difficult questions and dive into these stories of our faith, our ancient brothers and sisters and their journeys. And we thank you, Lord, that you brought us to this place. And we ask that you open our hearts, but also definitely our minds to what you would have us here today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the Rome, a Roman centurion. There you are. Settle down, ladies. Settle down. Here we go. Or some men here. Settle down, guys. Settle down. That is from the movie Risen. Has anyone seen the movie Risen? Really? We're in a church and you haven't seen the movie Risen? I cannot believe that. I haven't either. But anyway, so um, I hear it's good. 
Did you see it? You didn't see it? All right. Uh, Andrew, did you see it? You're a minister. You didn't see it? All right. Wow, I'm a little embarrassed, honestly. All right, so we didn't see the movie Risen, but that is the two main characters from the movie Risen. But they do, and they are uh, living, and, and they are, they're portraying a Roman centurion. So that's what they look like. That's what they wore. That's, who they, that's what they look like. That is the image I want to put in front of you this morning. Now, we know that the Roman Empire was advanced, some would say corrupted or immoral, or others would say advanced when it came to human sexuality. Plato said it this way, if a state or an army could be formed only of lovers and their beloved, how could any company hope for greater things than these? Even a few of them fighting side by side might well conquer the world. And again, love will make men dare to die for their beloved, love alone. Now we know Plato influenced the Roman Empire greatly. And so what he is saying here, if there was an army that was made up of men or women, but then at this time he would be addressing men, if there was an army that was made up of lovers, nothing could defeat that army because those lovers would never want their lover to be killed. Now in the Roman Empire time, if you were a soldier, it was strongly encouraged that you would not marry until after your time of service, okay? So it was a common practice that many Roman leaders in the army and soldiers would not marry until after their, uh, their service. So they discouraged heterosexual marriage. And from an historical perspective, a centurion that was in a same-sex relationship was not unusual. Some of you are thinking, well, I was just coming here today for a, a Labor Day message. I wasn't expecting this. This is, this is a lot. I, I know, it is. But thank God we're a church that will dare to wrestle with this. Okay? So in the time of the Roman Empire, Roman leaders, socialites, and the Roman um, uh, generals and what have you, it was very common for them to be in a place of practicing same-sex relationships. Now this was a very uh, contentious struggle for the Jewish people. They struggled with this. There was a lot that they struggled with the Romans. One of them is that they worshiped pagan gods. That drove them nuts all the time, okay? We know that through the New Testaments, New Testament writings. But one of the main things that also drove them nuts was their sexual advances and the fact that they would date and be with any person of sex. When, one year they were with a guy and the next time they were with the girl. This drove the Jewish people nuts so far that they came out and spoke against the practice of orgies, which was very common in the Roman time. Hello, good morning, I know it's Sunday morning, all right? So much that Paul would later write about this in his letters to the church, don't practice this, don't do this, don't do this stuff where you're in the temple and a lot of people are doing some sexual acts that aren't the greatest, aren't the holiest, that is, it, it, it defiles who you are. So he would write about these things because this was a daily practice of the Roman Empire. Some would say, my more liberal brothers and sisters, theologians, which I, I love to argue with, they would say that was wonderful, that's advanced, and that's great. My conservative brothers and sisters would take it to the other extreme and say, oh my gosh, everything's a sin. You have to wait till you're, you're married and you have to get this a piece of paper and, and you have to uh, be married for eternity and that's how it goes, okay? So you have these two extremes. What I'm proposing, right, as a people of faith, of intellect, and also connected to the Holy Spirit, that we wrestle with the fact that there has to be something in the middle when it comes to this. Okay. And again, I've said this before, and I was surprised, surprised I didn't get any uh, 
too, too much pushback last week, but I've said this before and I, I will say it again and again. My email is rich at missiongathering.com and you are, I invite you to meet with me and discuss this, okay? So, I grew up listening to the story of the Roman centurion and how amazing his faith was, and I'll talk about that. And the conversation that Jesus and this Roman centurion, this outsider of the faith, this non-Jewish man came to Jesus and had a request concerning a slave of his. I grew up listening to this story and hearing about how great his faith was, though he was not Jewish and he was not a follower of Jesus, but how great his faith was. I heard, I heard this my entire life growing up into and growing up in the church. But in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to start at verse 5. I want to break this story down to show you what myself and many noted theologians believe is taking place here. You with me? I'm a little nervous, but I'll shake it off, okay? Oh, by the way, do you guys like beer and hymns? Was that Great Friday? I wish I had a beer right now. I really do. It would help me. It would help me so much. We have some more down there, don't we? All right. <laughs> we can edit that out, can't we? I got it. Thank you. Matthew 8, and we're going to start at verse 5. And Jesus had entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him asking for help. He said, Lord, my servant, say servant, lies at home paralyzed, suffering, suffering terribly. Now for years, that was, that, was, that was the beginning of the story for me. And then about eight years ago, I stumbled upon some writings concerning this. And again, we have to look at the writings and how this was written from Hebrew to Greek. So it started in Hebrew and then translated to Greek. And then when we look at the word here in Matthew's account for the word servant, say servant again, the word is pace. Let me show you that word. Pace. In ancient Greece was widely used and understood as referring to someone in the same sex relationship. And again, it was not unusual for the Roman centurion and Roman soldiers to have male servants with whom they had sexual relationships with. In that, when we look at the word servant here, and we look in the, the word that it was written in Greek, the word servant, pace, is there. And pace was known, when they would write the word pace, it was known in ancient Greek as understanding, as referring to someone in a same-sex relationship. I did not hear this when I was 12 years old. I did not hear this. Many conservative theologians, people who do and study scriptures for a living, know this and do not address this. They know that that word servant is pace. Now the word pace, okay, the, it roots the word pedica, okay? You didn't think I was gonna go all the way here today, but I am. Pedica and pace basically are the same word and it means gay lovers, two people in a gay relationship. Pedica is referred to, to make some of you uncomfortable, but again, we gotta look at the context in which it was written, when a person would take a young person, an older person would take a younger person that had come to full height, which means they were not a boy, but older, probably 17, 16 or 17 or even 18, and take them as their male lover. Pace is from the word pedica, which means that someone took, all right? We do know that we've talked about how people were seen as property, 
and especially women and younger people would be taken as slaves or made servants at the time. And for the Romans, they would take a younger person, a pace, a pedica, and it would become a relationship of pace or pedica. It would mean taking a younger person in full height, so 16 or 17, thank God we've evolved, hello church. Okay, women used to be, had to get married at the age of 13. Okay? So we look at this culture, they would not go, oh my gosh, this is completely crazy. Today we would because we have evolved for the better. At this time, this was a norm. And so this Roman centurion, when he says servant, what he is saying here, I have chosen this man to be my servant. He has now become my pace. He is my gay lover. Happy Sunday, everyone. Woo! Some of you are wishing you were a little villager right now. You're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> this message is not being shared in there today. So you won't, you won't have your son or daughter saying, we learned about the word pace today, mommy and daddy. You won't have to wrestle with that later. With them. <laughs> now, this story is also written in the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, Luke uses a word for a word for servant as let me see, is it up there? Go to the next slide. There it is. Luke uses this word. And let me pronounce this to you because no one knows how to pronounce this. It's endemos diulos, which means my beloved. So you have Matthew's account of this story and now we're looking at Luke's. Again, we've wrestled with this. Who wrote Matthew? Who wrote the book of Matthew? Who wrote the book of Luke? My more liberal brothers and sisters would say this, the New Testament wasn't written until hundreds of years after the, uh, the life of Jesus. And my more conservative brothers and sisters would say it happened right then. They were kept going around with their iPad and tapping in the stories as they went. Again, you got this extreme, you have this extreme. Again, we are a church, we are a church that tries to find ourselves in the middle, in the balance of these things. I believe they were written near the time of Jesus, but not the day of Jesus. Okay? We're okay? All right. So we have this account. We have Matthew saying, my, my servant, my pace, my lover, right? And then you have Luke's terminology saying, my beloved. You have a Roman centurion who's always had slaves crossing cultural boundaries, crossing religious boundaries to go to a Jewish carpenter who says, my servant, my lover, the person who I beloved with everything I have in my heart is dying and I need you to do something because I've heard you can do some amazing things. That's what's happening here. When you really look at this story, if this was a true, mean Roman centurion, which we've seen over and over in the Roman Empire, if this was the case, he would not use such endearing words to describe his servant. He's using words of love. He's using words of affection. He's using words of commitment to a Jewish rabbi, a Roman leader, a Roman person of the Roman Empire, a centurion, is talking to a Jewish leader and he is saying, I love him. He's the most important thing in my life. Yes, it started out like everything else starts around here, conflicted and weird. And yes, I purchased him or I found him and I wanted him in my palace. But now 
I am in love with this person and he is my lover. He is my beloved and he is dying and I'm willing to allow all of your followers to talk about me and all of the Jewish leaders who are standing around watching me right now, I'm willing to bypass all that prejudice and judgment to come to you and say, can you please do something because of who I am and all my power it means nothing because my beloved is home dying. Will you please do something? That's what's happening right now. That's what's taking place. This is revolutionary stuff. And it's not new. It's been in the Bible since you and I were little kids. It's been in the Bible when your grandparents were little kids and their grandparents were little kids. And we have not addressed this. Can you imagine, straight or gay, can you imagine what this would have done to your spiritual journey if you heard this at the age of 12 or 13? Could you imagine how much it would have taken your world of going Christianity, Christianity to Christianity, Christianity, Christianity. So should we ignore the choice of words that the authors of Matthew and Luke use because it makes other Christians uncomfortable? No, and this church will not do that. We will not do that. Doesn't understanding the real meaning of pace and indulos as lover or beloved or same-sex lover place the centurion and his lover squarely in the cultural context of Matthew and Luke address? Doesn't it, isn't it something we should really wrestle with as followers of Jesus today more than ever? Now, I gotta give you a little history, just real quick, and I'm doing good on time. I don't have my, I don't have my iPad, so I don't know what time it is. Oh, I'm doing okay, I'm doing all right. <sighs> this Roman centurion, what we know, not, there's not a, the fact, this is the only Roman centurion that is really written about except at the crucifixion. And this Roman centurion is written about more than any other Roman centurion, meaning in this way. This Roman centurion is liked a lot because this Roman centurion has empathy for the minority. This jumped out at me in the last several days of studying this. This Roman centurion, within a majority is a minority because he is gay. This Roman centurion has empathy for the Jewish people, the minorities who are oppressed so much, this is in the scriptures, so much so he helps fund to build their synagogue. There's no other Roman centurion standing in line to give money to the Jews. This guy is. He loves the Jewish people. He loves the minorities. He supports them. He funds them, which means he must eventually at times protect them. So for me, when I read this, it comes alive that this man, there's a lot going on in this man's life. And he hears of this Jewish carpenter that is making a difference outside of the synagogue that he gave, he gave money for. And he hears of a, of a Jewish carpenter that is hanging out with those who are even smaller groups of minorities of minorities. He's hanging out with prostitutes. He's hanging out with those who've been rejected. He's hanging out with those who have a dreadful disease that is rotting the flesh off of them. He's hanging out in camps of people with leprosy. He's out with the outcast of the outcast 
and there's something radical happening. He's talking about a new kingdom, not an empire that he's busy building, but this carpenter, this Jewish man is talking about an empire of love and grace. He's talking about a kingdom of total love and acceptance. He's welcoming everyone in. This is so strange. I am at my last hope. I have to bypass everything and I've got to go to him. But this Roman centurion, the Holy Spirit is doing something in his life. The power of Jesus is drawing him in. So Matthew, let's go to Matthew 8. And he goes to Jesus. Remember, he went to Jesus, said, my pace is needing a healing. And let's go to verse seven. Shall I come and heal him? He says, Jesus, I need this. And there's, there's not a lot of convincing here. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Wow. Now we, we, you read the New Testament, hopefully. You, you know the New Testament. We've, we've, we've seen people struggling to get to Jesus. We've seen people who are not healed. We, we, we know this. We know that not all these miracles happen. And Jesus did ask a lot of questions of people and go, wait, what's going on here? And do you want to be healed? Uh, why are you like this? These are, these are stories all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here we have a Roman centurion who has a, 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 a lover, a, a same-sex lover back home. And he says, shall I come and heal him? Boom. He didn't say, oh, really? Are you serious? Do you know that I am a Jewish rabbi? I'm a Jewish leader. And do you know I'm changing this whole thing? And I despise how you treat us? You're my enemy? Didn't say that. He didn't say that. And he surely didn't say this. Oh, and by the way, you're gay and you're going to hell. You're going to burn for, for eternity, okay? In a big open field down the road where we burn stuff 24 seven, that's where you're gonna end up. He didn't say that. In other stories, Jesus did say, leave your life of sin. He did. Jesus said, leave your life of sin. You gotta leave it. I'm gonna change you right now, but don't go back to your unhealthiness. This man, oh, I'm going to get the emails and that's okay. This man is in a loving, committed relationship and he's committed to his partner, which remember Jesus was taking it from property to partnership. Remember we talked about that last week, taking it from women, from being property of men and making and saying, hey, this is what God intended. He intended everyone to be in partnerships, not property. He knows that this Roman centurion's already come into a place of committed, loving relationship. When it became legalized to marry across the United States, and in here in the state of North Carolina, when an 80-some-year-old uh, couples went downtown to get married, and they were together for 30-some years, when everything stood against them being together, that is what Jesus is addressing here. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. And should I go and heal your beloved? Wow. Now this is huge for my gay brothers and sisters. Or, you know what? Let me, let me take that back. <laughs> back up. This is huge for all of us because it's the satirian replies, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Wow. So long. The gay community and many of us who have been raised in the more conservative side of Christianity have constantly believed we do not, we do not deserve the love of Jesus. It's so wrong. It's so unhealthy. It's the opposite of the gospel. You know, I don't deserve you to be there. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be. Some of you feel like you don't even deserve to be in the house of God. And you deserve the love of God. You deserve the healthiness and the grace of God. You deserve it. You're God's creation. You are the beauty of God's handiwork. You are straight or gay, white and black, 
transgender, everything, all of it, you are the creation of God. I don't deserve it. But just say the what? What? Word. Just say it. Because what you say is powerful, Lord. I've watched you from a distance. And I've seen you look someone in the eyes as I was holding back Roman soldiers who wanted to jump and end this. I held them back and I watched you look a young girl in the eyes and say, but you're loved. You're loved. You're beautiful. I've seen you look a blind man who could not look back at you and was wondering what you looked like and grabbed you by the face and felt your beard and your long hair. And I saw you look into him and say, you can see now. And I watched these miracles happen. So just say the word. And my pace, there's that word, pace, servant. My lover, my beloved, will be what? Healed. Okay. Ooh, this is big. There was no condemnation. There was no, are you kidding me? Have you, have you listened to Jerry Falwell Jr.? Have you tuned in to Franklin Graham? Because I speak directly through them. Thank God he did not say that and nor does he say that today. I know I'm in Graham country. I know where I'm at. I drive that freeway all the time. And oh, how Billy is so disappointed in his boy. Billy is so disappointed in Franklin. You talking about self-hate? My goodness. In verse 9, the Roman centurion goes on to say this, For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And if I tell this one, go, and he goes, and then he goes, and I say to that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servants, my servant, do this, and he does it. It's very simple. You've impacted me. You haven't rejected me. You've impacted me. I see how you treat everyone. I was there when you said, love your enemies. I know I'm the enemy. There's something happening here. It's something world changing. I don't necessarily need you to go and be and come under my roof. I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with what these rabbis are thinking of me. I'm struggling, but I know authority. I know the power of a word. I know what you can do. Would you just say the word and I know it will happen. In verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was what, church? He was amazed. There's not many scriptures of the New Testament, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that says Jesus was amazed. There's a lot of scriptures of him being angry and frustrated and rolling his eyes. Okay? But Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, this is crucial, who's following him? Disciples who are Jews. This is crucial. Everything written here is so transformational, so life-changing, so empire-changing that it's crazy that we, Jesus was amazed and he said to those following him, I tell you, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel. Whoa, hold on here. So, whoa, the horses. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. faith. Oh my gosh. What is happening here is crazy. Rabbis are all watching like they've been. You got the disciples trying to, I'm, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. I'm gonna sit at the right hand, right? You have this. You have everything going on and he says, I have not found anyone with such, anyone in Israel, everywhere we've been people, with such great faith. Peter's like, really? Are you serious? <laughs> And Judas is like, mm, he's got money. This is good. <laughs> and John's like, oh, no, I'll get that faith. I'll get there. I'll do it, Jesus. <laughs> this is huge. And 
And he says, and then Jesus says this. I say to you that many, wow, that many will come from the east and the west. My Muslim brothers and sisters, hello. The children of our early fathers, the main religions of the world, they will come from the east and the west and they will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. This is just not a conversation of a gay centurion. This is God in the flesh addressing how he is reconciling the whole world unto himself. That everybody who thinks they cannot and do not and will not ever and man, do you turn on the television today? We're going to have a taco truck on every, every corner of the street. Won't that be the worst thing ever? No. Right? Talking about the kingdom of heaven. Right? This is real. The power, the power that's happening here. Everyone, east and west, far as you can look, the, you can, the kingdom of God is for everyone and all. Oh, you've been pushed out. You've been told you can't. You've been, you, now you're watching the television, my minority brothers and sisters, and you're being made to feel less because of the color of your skin. In the state of North Carolina, North Carolina you've been made to feel less because, because of your sexual identity and, 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 and you coming into the place that you know what you were supposed to be. You've been made to feel less. That's not the gospel of Jesus. It's the opposite. Jesus is saying, oh man, as far as your eye can see, that's where the kingdom of love is going to continue to transform people. In fact, this Roman centurion who is a gay person, right, who you rabbis judge all the time, but you still take his money. Isn't that politics? Hello? Lord, are we not finding that out now? Man. Stop, Rich. Okay, so... It's a lot happening. God in the flesh is bringing everyone in. And this Roman centurion, the oppressors of the Jewish people is included. It is of my humble theological opinion, this is when one of the leaders of the rabbis in the temple leaned over and said, he must be killed. He just brought in our enemies. He just embraced our enemy. When will this ever stop? We must kill this man. Jesus didn't just tolerate this gay centurion, but he used the centurion as an example of faith And then Jesus said to the centurion, go and let it be just as you have believed it would. Mm. And his servant, his pace, his lover, his beloved was healed that very hour. Just as you believed, you stepped out. You stepped out. You believed. You saw, you discovered, you stepped out in faith, and your faith has healed not only your heart, not only has it become a message of total inclusion for all, including the enemies. But your, your lover is well. He is healed. Go be with him. So we come to... Uh, this table of grace every week. And as I was 
working with this story and something was just kept in the back of my head, my theological head kept, kept ting, a little, a little, a ping was happening. Centurion, centurion, or st 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 centurion. What's, where did I know of another centurion? And in Matthew 27, when this Jewish carpenter, this kingdom builder of grace and love, when God himself was on the cross, it says this in Matthew 27, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, felt the earthquake, and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. I find it extremely interesting that the author of Matthew, be it Matthew or one of Matthew's close disciples, would write about the centurion and then include a centurion, which we do not know his name, at the foot of the cross, looking up at God on the cross with tears streaming down his face, looking up at this man, the only man that ever showed him true love and faith, the only man that loved him enough to heal his beloved, looked up and said, surely this was the Son of God. That's the gospel. That's the God that I invite you to encounter this morning. A God who would suffer with you. A God who will journey with you. A God who would bring you in close and let you know you're not a mistake. Maybe you've gotten some really bad religion in the past. Maybe you've been told by your parents this and that or your former lovers, whatever, God is saying to you this morning, all are welcome. Because the cross, God, Jesus, God in the flesh, had his arms outstretched from the east to the west that all could come and be a part of this thing. And the night before, he was with his closest disciples. his community, his best friends. And he lifted up the bread and he said, this is the body of my God, of your God, of me in the flesh, and it will be broken for all. Even the Roman centurion. And he took the wine and he poured it into the chalice. And he said, this is the love, the love of God that will be spilt for all, that will run down a tree. And when that love hits the ground, the entire earth will shake and everyone will know, surely, this is the Son of God. So what I want you to do, what I want to encourage you to do, because I know the Holy Spirit is moving big time, that you allow the Spirit of God to speak directly to your heart right now. So you close your eyes, please, and focus in on your journey and where you are and who you are, straight or gay, transgender, white, black, Mexican, this doesn't, doesn't matter, wealthy, poor, in the middle, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the arms of God. Let, let the Holy Spirit embrace you now. Let the spirit of total love and acceptance wrap itself around you right now. Now our, our, our pushback is we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it, but you are God's children and you deserve a loving God's embrace right now. You have to let go of past doctrine that has held you back from truly experiencing the kingdom of love. You have to let go of past voices that, that held you back from truly experiencing love and total love and total acceptance to take you to a place of healthiness. You have to step back out of the unhealthy practices that even happened this week that is holding you back, that is binding you, that is holding you, tying you up from being free. You can't run 
as a free, happy child, as we saw today, this child running up and down the aisles of this church today. You can't do that as a child of God because you're so, you're, you, you've allowed the past voices and sins of the past and sins of now to tie you up to where you can't move anymore. The, the darkness has just completely surrounded you in guilt and condemnation. Allow the Spirit of God right now, allow the Spirit of God to break you free. Remove those chains of bondage in the name of Jesus. Be gone in the name of Jesus. You are forgiven and know that. And as you come to these stations of grace, I ask that you take the bread and you, you dip it into the, the wine and you partake and you allow the warmth of the loving God to fill your soul right now. To fill your soul. Here we are, Lord. We don't, we just don't feel like we deserve you this morning. But help us to know we're loved. Fully loved. All of our messes, sins, and failures, they melt in your presence. Let us feel your grace and your love, and may we know it to be true for us. Do business with God today. Come when you're ready. God has been ready.